Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman. I sometimes feel I'm living in a Salvador Dali world, a Dali-esque world. I'm surrounded by science publications which in uh, impact look as though they're highly detailed technical competent studies. But as you started to hear from these two gentlemen and others at this conference, as soon as you delve into the details, the watches aren't flat. They are indeed drooped over the branches. I call this Dali-esque science and the question is, why is it? How have we got to Dali-esque science on climate change? And the answer is, regrettably, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There are four things you need to know about the IPCC. The first is that it is not, as many people think, set up to advise on global climate system overall. It's set up with a highly restricted brief to study a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity through the medium of greenhouse gases. Now that is setting out to study one of the most complex scientific problems you could pick, climate change, and to study it with glasses and blinkers on. That is not the way to do good science. So point one, the IPCC does not study climate change in the round, it studies climate change through the lens of carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere. Point two about them is no matter how many times they tell us that they are a scientific body, they are wrong. They are an appointment by the United Nations and the individual scientists on the panel are appointed by their governments and they are a political body, albeit advised by good scientists, but nonetheless a political body. As their own chairman, Rajendra Pachari, said last year, we are an intergovernmental body and we do what the governments of the world want us to do. If the governments decide we should do things differently and come up with a vastly different set of products, we would be at their beck and call. Number one, they have a restricted brief. Number two, they are an overtly political body. Number three, Fred has already referred to this. These are the statements they've made in their five successive assessment reports, uh, the, the headline uh, capturing summary statement. And the first one in 1990 said, the observed 20th century temperature increase could largely be due to natural variability. Well, astonishingly, that statement is not only still true, but there's a very great deal more evidence that that is true now than there was in 1990. Nonetheless, in successive years after 1990, each year we got a more alarmist statement. The next one was the balance of the evidence suggests a discernible human influence. The next one was there is new and stronger evidence that. And then, blow me down, I've lost my pointer. For the last two years, we end up with these statements. It is very likely defined as 90% probable or extremely likely greater than 95% probable. That, ladies and gentlemen, is hocus pocus science. I'm sorry, this is playing up. Hocus pocus science. Fred referred to this and he was very gentle with it, I thought. Uh, my take on this is that any scientist who's associated with an organisation that say, takes something like uh, a statement like extremely likely, an English expression of opinion, and translates it into a probability statement, well basically what the IPCC is doing is redefining probability theory. Here is the table, the list of instructions that go to their authors as to what they are meant to use in these terms in terms of this assessed probability. But there's no trials, there's no numbers, there's no science behind this at all. It is hocus pocus. So, the IPCC has a restricted brief, it's a political body, it's increasingly alarmist over the years, and it conducts hocus pocus science. Now here's four things you need to know about the NIPSI. The first is that NIPSI advisory scientists are fully independent they're not appointed by governments, they're beholden to nobody, and many, being retired, are also highly experienced and knowledgeable in their field. 
Secondly, NIPSI activities are funded by untied family foundation contributions to the Hartman Foundation. There is no financial conflict of interest whatsoever in terms of individual NIPSI scientists or in terms of funding from so-called big oil and big coal. Thirdly, NIPSI summarizes the peer-reviewed scientific literature about climate change in the round. It doesn't start with carbon dioxide blinkers. It makes no a priori assumptions about the importance of particular causatory agents for climate change. And lastly, NIPSI acts, and Willie's already referred to this, as a red team that undertakes due diligence, basically, on the conclusions and recommendations of the IPCC Green Team. And many of you will be aware that in industry and the defence forces and other places, the, blue t the um, Green Team, Red Team concept is a tried and trusted management method of getting to the truth of something. Well, it's all about scientific technique, and America hosted one of the very great scientists, not just of the 20th century, but of all time, in Richard Feynman. His description of the scientific process was, in general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. We guess it. Scientists play. That's what they do. They think and they play. And that guess is called a hypothesis. Secondly, we compute the consequences of the guess to see what would be implied if this law or relationship that we'd guessed was right. This really is problematic. Then we compare the result of the computation to nature. With experiment or experience, we compare it directly with observation to see if it works. It's that simple statement that is the key to the scientific method. It does not make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It does not make any difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his or her name might be. If it disagrees with experiment or observation, it is wrong. The hypothesis of dangerous anthropogenic global warming has been repeatedly test, tested against observation and against experiment because the computer models are experiments and it has repeatedly failed those tests. Dangerous anthropogenic global warming is an invalidated hypothesis. Now, in contrast to the Dali-esque world, we see here one of America's famous super-realist painters, Andrew Wyeth, and one of his most famous paintings, Christina's World. Christina is gazing with intense gaze on a distant house. And what is going through her mind? Nobody quite knows. It's a mysterious painting. That scientists are NIPCC scientists looking at the house of climate change. We don't know what's going on inside it, but we sure as hell know that the answer to finding out is careful thought and hyper-realistic observation. Whatever else you know about Christina, she's surely a lead member of the NIPCC red team. <laughs> the role of hypothesis testing in science is the key. Implicit in all IPCC writings, though rarely explicitly stated, for example, the uh, television people here interviewing and the reporters here interviewing will ask you questions like, is climate change happening? Is global warming happening? These are totally meaningless questions. The question in, 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 in the case is that dangerous global warming is happening and it's resulting or will result from human-related greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions. That is the testable hypothesis of dangerous anthropogenic global warming. The IPCC, the green team, living in their Dali-esque world, toils unceasingly to discover or provide evidence that validates that hypothesis. That is the absolute inverse of scientific procedure. The NIPCC team takes the null hypothesis, which is all scientists look around them and they see that the climate varies. That's what climate does through time, it changes. The null hypothesis, the simplest hypothesis that explains the facts is therefore that the currently observed changes in global climate and in the physical and biological environment associated with that result from natural variability. That may or may not be true, but that is the null hypothesis. And what NIPCC does, 
because the red team examines all evidence to try to invalidate that null hypothesis. Ladies and gentlemen, since 1990, more than $100 billion has been spent worldwide by scientists trying to find the signature of dangerous human-caused global warming. They have failed. Despite more than $100 billion, this null hypothesis remains as true today as it was in 1990 when it should first have been formulated but wasn't by the IPCC. Now, we're a funny species. We try, especially those of us who dignify the name ourselves with the name of scientists, to be unemotional, to be objective about facts, and to treat the world in a totally objective way. We're human, we can't do it, we try. You don't have to be religious to have an emotional stir from Christ redeemed statue, the famous uh, angel, guardian angel uh, of Rio de Janeiro sitting up there above the city. It's one of the most famous sculptures of the 20th century. If we now go to Northern England, we have Angel of the North. Uh, this was put up in 1931. This was put up in 1998. And you might say, as the summary of a troubled century, the Angel of the North is about as good a, an image as you could get. Very thought provoking. But I believe the world's most outstanding guardian angel is one that most of you have been and seen the sight of, but you haven't actually seen the guardian angel. And here it is. It's the eastern part of New Zealand, a little island called Pitt Island off the Chatham Islands. Out there, 10,000 kilometers away, with nothing between us and it, is South America. We are looking out into the deep Pacific Ocean, and this is the easternmost point of land to the west of the international date line. So when in 2000, all or most of you sat around your televisions and watched that magnificent program of the dawn of the new millennium around the world, the very first image came from the top of this mountain, Mount Hakipa on Pitt Island in the Chatham Islands of New Zealand. There is a millennial sculpture put up there by a, a Polish-born Austrian uh, artist called Clemens Jockel Wojtek, and it just looks like a bunch of sticks until you look closely. And when you look closely at the head of each of these sticks, they carry an exquisitely sculpted bronze. And those bronzes are, from left to right, the astronomer. And what characterizes the astronomer is questing. Next, the philosopher, characterizing wisdom and integrity. Next, the newborn baby, new ideas, future hope, 10,000 kilometers of ocean in front of us, or if you like, 10,000 years of time, and we would like to know what the climate's going to do over that time. And finally, the Maasai warrior, the dignity and strength. Ladies and gentlemen, the NIPCC, the red team, is the guardian angel of integrity in climate science. Ooh. Here are five or six conclusions that come from the NIPSI report, the first volume on physical sciences. The assumption that prior to the Industrial Revolution, the Earth had a more stable climate is simply wrong. Climate has always changed, it always will. There's nothing unusual whatsoever about modern magnitudes or rates of change of temperature, ice volume, sea level, or extreme weather events. The most likely medium-term threat, and you've heard several speakers refer to this already, is actually of damaging cooling, not warming. Atmospheric carbon dioxide is neither a pollutant nor is it the primary forcing agent for temperature change. Rather, carbon dioxide is an overall benefit for humankind and the planetary environment. Attempting to stop climate change is an expensive act of utter futility. Very interesting. President Obama, just last week, made his announcement about more imposition of regulation to shut down coal-fired power stations through the EPA. What escaped most people's attention was that in the same speech, he actually adopted the solution to climate hazard that most independent scientists have been recommending for the last 20 years. And it is that the only sensible thing to do about climate change is to adapt to it. 
both benign warmings and the more dangerous coolings. You don't try and stop a volcanic eruption, you don't try and stop uh, 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 an earthquake, and you know you can't stop hurricanes. You prepare for them and you adapt to them. President Obama, he would be the first to deny it, has just set up the first international, it's American, but it's the first international example of a billion dollar fund aimed at climate resilience. That, ladies and gentlemen, is where this will end up. All politicians in all countries ultimately are going to end up in that wheelbarrow. It's just a matter of how long it takes us to get them there.